What's up, party people? It's Keys Dan with RadioWhat.com, DJLittleRock.com, coming to you live and in living color from the Radio What studios. And this is my podcast, What Makes You Famous? It's an extension of the RadioWhat.com internet radio station that I've been running for quite some time. And if you need DJ services, where do I always send you? Say it with me, DJLittleRock.com. One more time djlittlerock.com. Check availability and get a free price quote, and maybe you can have me at your next event. You know I like to party with the people. The people need to be entertained. Are you not entertained? Let me entertain you. Maybe I'll sing for you. Maybe I won't. Make your next thing a big one. Hey, today on the program, speaking of entertainment, I have Erin O'Dowd. She's a singer-songwriter out of Tulsa, Oklahoma, Living on Tulsa time. Did I have to? Maybe. Yes, I did. And she's in between Tulsa and Nashville is where she spends most of her time. You're going to get to hear a little bit more about Aaron O'Dowd in the next few minutes. This week's shows. Oh, I have my one, count them one, public show. My faithful Friday night gig at the Rab in Conway, Arkansas. The video dance party karaoke jam. Yes, I said karaoke. You're the stars of the show. We got a little concert starring each and every one of you. If you sing in the shower, if you sing in the car, you could sing on stage at the Rab in Conway, Arkansas. They got a full bar. The kitchen's open. Pool tables. They got a pool tournament on Friday night. So if you want to try your hand at playing pool and possibly make some money while you're doing it, while you're waiting to sing on stage next to yours truly, Come on out to the Rab in Conway, Arkansas. Oh, and there's dancing, too. We got plenty of space for dancing. Grab your honey. Get to the dance floor. Uh, and uh, Saturday, my goodness, usually I save that for weddings and parties and special corporate events and birthdays and, oh, yeah, uh, 50th anniversaries. Uh, all kinds of events. Anytime you need some music, you call on Keys Dan, DJLittleRock.com. Now, this Saturday, I got nothing right now. So uh, if you have some last-minute gigging in the central Arkansas area, you give me a call, 501-470-6386, or just check uh, djlittlerock.com. All right, that's it for the intro. Let's get into it with Erin O'Dowd. I got her on Skype, so if you're listening to the audio version, I encourage you to check out the video version on my YouTube page, youtube.com forward slash user forward slash Keys Dan. Skyping Erin O'Dowd. Now, Aaron O'Dowd, what's happening? Not a lot, just hanging out. I like just hanging out. Hanging out is good. I, I, I find myself in a hustle and bustle, always on the move, always got something to do. Thankfully, I have these podcasts at night, Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays. Usually, I schedule these things to, 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 uh, clear my head and have an actual conversation with somebody such as yourself, Aaron O'Dowd. Uh, How are you? I'm, I'm so glad you're here. I, I've been me? perusing your, your YouTube and your sound. Well, your SoundCloud, it's a, uh, it seems to be a collection of other people's things. That seems to be what you, you've made your SoundCloud into maybe like a Spotify, uh, for your own personal use where you have your, your faves on there, but YouTube is pretty cool for you, but, uh, you know, while I have you here, uh, give the people an idea of who you are. First of all, I'm a singer songwriter from Tulsa and Nashville. At this point, I moved out there a few years ago, spent a few years there and I've been back in Tulsa for a couple of years and, uh, recovering from some health. I'm kind of gearing back up into music. Lately. So it's been really fun getting back to doing what I love. And um, I do like Americana, which is kind of like country, singer, songwriter, folk, rock. And mine is pretty soul influenced. You know, it's it's interesting conglomeration of different genres. So I like that. I don't like to be boxed in. So Let me, let me hold you there. Do you have a Bluetooth headset? Because I want this to sound as good as it could possibly sound. Or even, you know, just a regular headphone set. You're on your phone, right? I'm on my phone. I don't have... Like headphones? I don't. I have TMD, so I have trouble putting things in my ears. It hurts. Um, okay. I'm trying to think what I could do. I could move closer, further away. Let's no. see. We'll fix we it have- in post. No big deal. 
Okay. But, but I'm getting the idea. I'm just getting a lot of background noise, and you know, I want it. I want the people to to hear Erin O'Dowd in all her glory because I I listen to your YouTube uh, videos, and let me tell you, you have some really good YouTube videos uh, of yourself and your band. But the the one that I like the best, the one that really shows you off the best, is the and I, and, and I I encourage people to go to uh, Aaron O'Dowd's uh, YouTube page. It's EO Diddy, and there's one where you're on the porch swing sessions, and it's called Queen of the Silver Dollar. That one, oh my goodness! If it doesn't <laughs> encompass your old timey. You're taking it back to the country roots, but still showing that you have the ability to sing any song in what in in, in the style. It's not even a country style. It's the Aaron O'Dowd style. You're putting your own twist on so many different songs, but that one I like the best, Queen of, of the Silver Dollar. Tell me about the Porch Swing Sessions. Um, that was something that I really, when I first moved to Nashville, I had a front porch with swing and I wanted to start a little um, music series where I had other artists come out and play on the porch and uh, unfortunately I never really took off I actually got too busy with my career in Nashville to really do it so that was the first and last <laughs> session but I loved it and it was good to get that busy trust me it's it's always good to to get busy Oh, no, that's a good problem to have is getting busy, you know, especially in the music business, because it's always a hustle. You're always trying to find that next gig. Yes, you get to this gig and then you, you have to keep promoting yourself even during that gig. Shoot, I, as a DJ, uh, people go, oh, DJs promote themselves more than anything. Well, all right, I got this gig. I'm at your wedding. I'm at your event, you know, but I, I, I you know, I'll say my name maybe one or two times. I, it is all about the person or the venue or the event but as a, a you know as a, a music a person in the music industry that you've you've chosen this as your career it's always a, a hustle a grind to get to the next event yes i have booked this show at this venue but um you know while you're here if you happen to have a venue in the future why don't you hire aaron o'dowd <laughs> right Absolutely. all about it Love playing shows. Well, yeah. Uh, okay, so I've seen some videos where you have like a full band and then you have uh, the duo and, of course, being a guitarist, you have the ability, the superpower to busk, to go anywhere and sit in a stool and play a song and entertain people while they're having their hors d'oeuvres, they're having their drinky poos, Aaron <laughs> O'Dowd sitting there providing the entertainment, giving them a little ambiance, ch uh, changing moods, changing lives. If they've, if they've had a rough week, if they've had a rough day, listen to a little Aaron O'Dowd, and for sure, it's going to change their moods. They're going to feel good. And you, what makes you want to harken back to the old school country? Is that something you grew up on? No, not really. Um, I grew up in church in like a hyper-religious environment, and but I've always loved music. I started playing piano too and um gosh i guess some of the early music i listened to is like amy grant michael w smith that i can still get behind amy grant was amazing especially in her pop phase and um classical music and then when i started let's see when i started like growing up you know getting about nine or ten years old i got really into like nirvana and pearl jam and the cranberries you know all the stuff that was really popular in the 90s because um, I am I'm an '80s baby, grew up in the '90s, so yeah, that's when I kind of started to discover a lot of different kinds. Of music. I mean, I would look for, like genuine and you know <laughs> anybody uh, TLC. So I feel like just listening to music um, shaped me, and and my family hated country music and made fun of it. But once I actually discovered real country music, like Willie Nelson and um Merle Haggard I think I got the Highwaymen on vinyl when I was like 15 and I was like I love country music why did they say it's bad like I love this so much and so I kind of fell in love with it on my own and, and by the time I discovered Amy Lou Harris it was because people were telling me that I sounded like her when I sang and I didn't know who she was <laughs> which is embarrassing now she's like my favorite singer you know and I got to have lunch with her 
in Nashville and at her house. And it was just uh, incredible. Um, I don't know that she remembers me, but you know, we talked for a long time and, um, yeah, yeah. So it just, I don't know. It just called to my soul. I guess I love like really roots music, you know, hearing like the old spiritual songs or songs that were brought over from Europe, American music Anything that feels like, like there's a lot of meaning behind it. You know, and it really just comes from the heart. That's that's a step I, I resonate with the most deeply. Well, Aaron O'Dowd, it seems like you were country when country wasn't cool, and that's a little a little <laughs> harken to Barbara Mandrell. But uh, my goodness, okay. you know, you're from Tulsa, Oklahoma. I've spent some time in Tulsa. There's a that's right on the path of Route 66. You know where where music and poetry and you know America really. It is on that highway, on that that route way. When I was driving through, I saw the there. Do you have like this big oiler type of guy? Kind of. Uh, there's like a a giant uh, statue, right? Mm, the golden driller. That's what it's called. That's what it is. And then you mm. also have, uh, you know, you were talking about the Bible. You're definitely in a notch in the Bible belt growing up, uh, you know, in, in, in uh, I guess, a Christian or, or some uh, form of it. Uh, mm -hmm. Isn't there an ark in, in Tulsa? Oh, I don't know about the ark. I heard about that. Or something. There's, there's a big um, Bible school there, isn't there? Yeah, well, there's... I think there's like a Victory Bible College or Rama Bible College. There's like a ORU, Oral Roberts University is here. That's the one I saw when I was driving by. I went, huh, Oral Roberts. Okay. Uh, you know, as a kid in, you know, I, I'm a child of the seventies, grew up in the eighties, you know? So I guess I'm, I'm about maybe 10, maybe even 20 years old. I'm 53 years old. So born in 69, but I'm a child of the eighties. And, and I remember Oral Roberts being on TV from time to time and, and, uh, you know, go, go into Tulsa. I guess I was there maybe four or five years ago. And I, I, I went to the hard rock cafe and that was pretty cool. That there's a hard rock in in Tulsa, but there's a, a lot to see. Tell me what uh, growing up in Tulsa, how what is that like? Is it um, I mean, is it amazing or is it boring or is uh, it you, you all all you wanted to do was get out like every other kid? You know, whenever they're in a town, I don't care how big the town is or how small the town is. Uh, most of the time, people want to bust out. But tell me, what do you think of Tulsa and what do you think of of how you grew up? Uh, well, I moved here when I was about 11 years old. So I actually grew up in Florida before that in Tampa. And so it was a bit of a culture shock. Honestly, a huge culture shock. I thought it was super boring. Um, very suburban, I don't know, and very white. And that growing up in Florida, like my school was just so diverse. And I also went to a very small school there. So it was like the same 30, 40 kids in my grade. For, from when I was two until 11. So I, I had a hard time, like, the first few years, just trying to, like, adjust to a new place, and um, there just wasn't as much stuff to do here then. Um, but the older I got, I think it became more fun. I got into a lot of different activities. I did pre-professional figure skating. I did ballet. <laughs> and so I was hanging out with Tulsa ballet, ballerinas at their parties, and I was, like, 17, you know. And just being a crazy kid, you know, yelling, that, that's when it was more fun. I, I was like, I quit going to church, I do my thing. I started really focusing on songwriting and making art as well. Um, I don't really call myself a visual artist because I, I just don't really do it much anymore. But I went to college for that for a little while. And um, I just switched gears over to music. And Tulsa definitely had like, the older I got, I had more of an art. Once I kind of got to 17, 18, and, um, and I enjoyed that. There was a lot of great artists. Some of them I'm still friends with that I met at that time. And like my friend, Chris Mantle, he paints these amazing Buffalo paintings. And yeah, it was, Tulsa is an interesting city in that kind of small, but it's not a small town, you know? So it's, <laughs> It's like, you know, the seven degrees of Kevin Bacon thing here. That's like four, you know, and it's just, it can feel way too small. You can't get away from people. It's hard to drive. They're just, 
Well, I appreciate you giving shout outs to people as as we go along. Give shout outs as you tell your story, as Aaron O'Dowd's yeah. story unfolds give credit where credit is due you already give fr- uh, credit to your artist friend there and i want people to go in and find him as well but mm-hmm. you know similarly i'm from miami the florida keys that's where keys oh. dan came from i'm from the beach you know i miss the ocean so much and try going 40 years your whole life growing up in Miami, in South Florida, Florida Keys. Yes, I've traveled across the country here and there from time to time. But at 40, bam, starting all over again in Conway, Arkansas. Yeah, there's 50,000 50, people here, but it was different. You're talking about culture shock. I'm with you on that. I'm half Cuban, half Irish. You know, and I I think I, I have a, a, a cousin who's black as night. So I know that diversity is is me, you know, I, I'm, I'm a mutt and we, you know, we, we knew all kinds of people in our, our grades, you know, in our classes, but then, you know, you come to another place and it's a whole nother country, but yes, at like you, uh, you know, over the past 12, 13 years, I've kind of grown to appreciate it. We overcome, mm-hmm. we adapt humans. That's what we can do. But you yeah. as a creative, you have a mind that, you know, not only can sing, but also also can song write all these experiences that you have from Tampa to, to Tulsa to Nashville, <laughs> they become songs. I mean, tell me about the songs that you've written. Cause I did notice that one of the latest songs you have, uh, is, um, is called trick pony. And, and that you made a music video in a, in an antique store in, in, in Tulsa. Tell me about that and your friends that helped you out on that thing. Yeah, that was the right kind of decided, you know, I first on your, so I'm sorry, I decided, screw it. I'm going to make a music video. I don't, I didn't have a budget of any kind. I didn't have anything planned out, but I realized I know a lot of creative people. And I think I was at a friend's show, like a local show. And I started talking to my friend about it. I know you should ask this person, you should ask this person. And so just through that conversation, I realized I can do this. And I I had an idea. And so I just called my friends and I said, I I texted everybody. I'm like, can you meet me tomorrow at the Walmart at 81st and uh, gosh, where is it? Yale or whatever in Tulsa. And yep, everybody met me and we just started filming. (laughs) We just started having fun and and then we went to the Target in Tulsa Hills, and then we went to uh, Route 66 Antique Mall on Peoria. And a friend of mine who's kind of a carny, um, like horror film sets, he also walks on stilts and breathes fire. He met up with me, and he's in the video. Um, he's the first person you see in the video. Cornelius Cobb is his name, Corn Cobb for short. <laughs> and he did a great job with the video. He didn't want like shout outs or credit, but I'm because he, he really helped bring everything to life. And, um, unfortunately we didn't have time to do the stilts or the fire breathing, but (laughs) I think the video turned out well and it was just fun and, um, ended up getting picked up by American songwriter and getting a premiere on their website on the front page. And so what, what, you know, like my initial first music video, um, uh, was on there And, and I filmed most of it myself as um did the editing and that was a really fun adventure i just did it on iphone um on the what's it called iMovie and um it wasn't that bad it wasn't too hard so no not that. bad at all my goodness and you you've give uh you know credit where credit is due definitely on the uh on the the show the notes on that video uh, you uh, you know and by all means I, this is not uh sponsored by apple in any way but the iphone <laughs> you have really shown that it does, it works well. And everybody needs to have a Cornelius Cobb, a corn cob in their life, a, a, a man that will dress like a pink bunny for your entertainment pleasure, for your music video. So, yeah, I, I commend him and, and all your friends that, that were playing around on, on, in that store. You make me want to go to that store. So, you know, you're, you're a part of the Tourism Bureau of Tulsa, and especially the I forty four mall, uh, or I guess was that that what it was the I I forty four. I'm bad with remembering the name now. You know, uh, 
I'm looking right at it. Oh, the I-44 Antique Mall in Tulsa. Yeah, yeah that's it's, it. Yeah, it's right off of uh, I-44, so that makes sense. I'm not sure what happened there. I, it's. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, no problem. I had something pop up. <laughs> <laughs> ah, computers, they're wonderful, aren't they? Technology. Yeah. Now, here's another thing that you've capitalized on, and I hope that it takes off. Every artist, every musician, every uh, person that plays any instrument and sings, anybody that sings a song should sing a Christmas song any <laughs> way that you want because, that, you know, people will say, oh, how, you know, how do you make money uh, in the music business? With Christmas music, okay, because that pops up every year forever and ever and ever if you get one that's popular, I hope that I hate Christmas by Aaron O'Dowd becomes the most popular Christmas song ever because that's mailbox money. That's money. When you sleep, that's a na na na. I got paid while I was sleeping today. No Christmas songs. I, I, I just recently found this out on a podcast. My goodness, the, the money to be made on a Christmas song. And yes, uh, you, you do this be, for the love and my good, oh, uh, you, you love playing music, but you got to make a living too, right? Mm-hmm, absolutely. <laughs> so tell me about I Hate Christmas. I know I listen to it, but uh, tell me about that. <laughs> yeah, that was a song to write for some years. I, yeah, I had two lines, you know, and one Christmas in Nashville that was particularly terrible, um, it came to mind, and I, I think I'm going to try to write this song, like, this is the time, it's Christmas, I'm depressed, and I was out on a walk one night, and it's, like, freezing cold, and I'm looking at all of the Christmas decorations and feeling dejected, and it just started to come out, and I worked on it up until, I want to say, the following summer, and so I actually finished it in the summer, and um, what motivated me to finish it was getting a call from a friend um, who wanted submissions for like a lifetime Christmas movie. And I was like, okay, that's going to motivate me. I would love to have a sync placement. I've never done that before. And, and Clayton Colvin and I got, got together. He helped me finish the song. And I, I rarely co-write, although I'm trying to bring it out into that. But um, I'm probably will soon. But he helped me finish it. He's an awesome singer-songwriter, Clayton Colvin. He's out of Nashville. Bill, and he's played shows with like Jason Isbell. He's a great guy. And um, so we recorded the song with our friend Keith Corduroy and um, at his home studio. We were his first client. He is also a very talented um, band leader, singer, songwriter. He does like cosmic country and um, some soul influence there. That's awesome. So yeah, we recorded the song and I kept it under my belt until last Christmas. I decided to release it and it was very cathartic, honestly. It's it, it just helps, like, as someone who doesn't really enjoy Christmas <laughs> and get sentimental, like, I can enjoy the, the decorations or, like, the feeling of, like, yay, you know? I, I, there are certain things that I do like about it. I'm not, like, a total Grinch, okay? But I'm just, like, not into, like, the social pressure to, like, oh, everything's perfect, having a great time. I think it's really unrealistic, and a lot of people really struggle on the whole Like, not everybody has this picture of perfect relationship with their family really nobody's relationship is perfect you know don't BS you so it, it's just really nice to have an alternative you know I, I think a lot of artists they put out Christmas songs but they're all pretty similar in a way and that bores me and so it I did enjoy kind of writing a song that was kind of anti-social counterculture Christmas song but yet it's still a really relatable song because it's about getting dumped on Christmas Full disclosure, I, I did get dumped right before Christmas, and it was very terrible, very cruel uh, breakup. And um, yeah, so it's it's a relatable song in that way, and and I really enjoyed putting it out. I would like to kind of re-record maybe a full band time, and um, you know, get some rockettes and music. We'll see. <laughs> no, growing up, I mean, I I was born into a Catholic family, and I I know Christmas was very important to my family growing up, but I always felt the pressure. You have to get everybody you know, everybody you love, a present. 
you know, and that sent, felt like the commercial part really set down on me when it, it, talking about Christmas. So I'm buying people the stupidest gifts, the dumbest gifts, you know, and as a kid, they were real small. You know, I bought everybody, a, uh, you know, a, a card or something and it was terrible, you know, and, and or I, I, I think as I, I grew older, I bought all the women, uh, sweaters and I bought all the men, uh, fishing knives and i went why why did i do that i bought people cologne that they'll never wear i bought people flowers that they'll never you know things that I, I, i'm i'm a terrible gift giver and i don't think that i've ever gotten a gift that was perfect for me i mean that maybe maybe i'm i'm digressing but but the the commercial part of of christmas is oh so weird so weird to me but you know what's funny is I, I, you made me think of it. I have a Christmas song out there uh, that I made when I was working at a at a, at a record. Uh, I'm sorry, a, a radio station down in Little Rock, Arkansas. It was on the whim, on the spur. It's out there. Keys Dan and Jack Hama, and it's called hashtag No Snow. So <laughs> and and it was the hook was There's no snow on Christmas this year. No snow. No snow. You know, and it was so stupid. But I put it out there, and you know, every year I put it back out there. But yes, your Christmas song—it has meaning to you. You were dumped before Christmas. That sucks. But maybe the guy—I mean, was there a reason? Did he give you any reason, or was it just the pressure of trying to <laughs> trying to get you a present for Christmas? Oh gosh, I, like what do? I, how do I? Do that? Uh, I don't know. I think he's a artist, but that's that's what everybody says these days. Um, <laughs> It was years ago now, too, so I, I honestly don't really have, like, an emotional charge to the story anymore. I just think it's funny um, that I actually did throw his presence in the snow, which is a line in the song. <laughs> <laughs> I had decorated. We had just moved together a few months, and I had decorated the house one day and surprised him and I there was like this little mini Christmas tree he had not the tiny tiny ones but ones that you put on the floor and they're like two feet tall and I had the garland and stuff so I just like picked the whole thing up and threw it in the front yard <laughs> not like while he was there it wasn't like the violence that before anybody like freaks out you know people will freak out I didn't I don't even think he was there when I did it but I was just like you know what we had like six inches of snow which is kind of rare for Tulsa and I just threw it out there and um, I kind of left it there for like a day or two and then I re-gifted the present to um, his friend that was going to come and house it while he was on tour I was like here um, I ungifted this from him and I'm giving it to you and he was like sure I'll drink it it was like really nice beer other stuff remember uh, <laughs> I'm just thinking about the little Charlie Brown Christmas tree that doesn't have a home anymore. A little two foot tree. You remember in the Charlie Brown Christmas, they got this yeah. little tree and all they had to do was wave their hands in front of it. And it was decorated magic. I love it. <laughs> all right. Christmas time. I love it. You know, and, and I do appreciate the brotherhood and the, and, and the togetherness and people get together around the holidays. That's nice. You know, it's good to check up on people, check up on them all year long. In, in fact, you know, the homeless people, they only, only, they only have to eat on Thanksgiving and Christmas. Everybody knows that, right? Right. Yes. That's the only time to give gifts to them. Yes. <laughs> take care. Take care of each other. You take care of yourself. Make sure that you're straight and you know, that you have yourself in order and then try to take care of somebody else. That's what we need to be doing in this crazy world of ours. All right, your YouTube page, it's been going at least for eight years. Is that when you really put your foot down and started going into this uh, business called Muzak uh, when you gave up the, the art career? Um, I, well, I started getting out and playing when I was like 17. I started doing open mics, I guess. And then um, I guess I think I started taking it more seriously like a career, you know, like playing regularly when I was like 21, 22, I was in a band for a little while called the Lolitas and I played the bass guitar. Actually, I, I had really bad performance anxiety. So 
as someone that struggles from like social anxiety still, but um, it used to be a lot worse. So that kind of helped break me into performing. I, I didn't want to be like, you know, the front and center on the stage. I had a, a hard time. So, you know, a couple of whiskey and then just being the backup bass player like that made it possible. And then I kind of got tired of playing with that band. It wasn't really going anywhere. And um, I was just kind of like, eh. So that kind of ended in my own thing. So that was really a good, um, you know how things like, they don't work out and it's kind of disappointing, but then actually it makes way for something better. And that's that's kind of what happened when I left that band. It, it really was a good good timing for me to start taking, taking it more seriously. And I'm glad I did. Well, I, I'm a guy that likes to support local artists, and I, I'm a fan of the rhythm section. I like the bass player. I, I, I like the, most of the time I'll, I'll go see a, a band and I'll watch the bass player because they got bass face. Whenever they're whenever they're playing the <laughs> yeah. bass, they really j jam it up. I, you know, you saying that you were kind of a a shyer person with a little bit of stage fright. That you at least you know when you were playing the bass, really get into it and and you know tongue out oh. and teeth and ah, just having fun with it. I don't know that I made quite that face, but I, I I think I had a face. I don't know what it was. Like, usually in the pictures, I'm just, like, real stoic, you know, standing back. But I loved it. It was it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed playing with the drums and that interplay between the drums and the bass and, like, finding the, the deep pocket and kind of grooving back into the pocket. You know, I would love to play bass. I would love to, you know, play bass clubs. I think that's really challenging, actually. And there's a couple singer-songwriters I know that do that. Um, Mila Vera, she plays the stand-up bass and sings, and she's, wow, it's incredible. Um, I'm trying to think of what I've seen do that. It's really impressive. Well, I'm, I'm thinking of Sting and Paul McCartney. Hello, you oh, know. Yeah. These are two bassists that, that made it huge. And then, you know, Flea, he doesn't sing all that much, if, he, if, if at all. But, I mean, one heck of a performer with the bass. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. You know, it, it, he, he, he made that bass really a, a, a part of the show, you know, just getting out there mm -hmm. and having fun with it. But, yeah, the rhythm section, that's what puts the feet on the dance floor, you know, it is that bass, that drum beat, that is what's – driving the music and then yeah you have your your lead guitar your vocals and that's what uh tells the story you know mm -hmm. but uh but i mean did you did you take uh like r real training uh to learn guitar or do you can you read music how did you how did you first learn how to play guitar uh i taught myself how to play guitar i took one lesson and i didn't like it and so i just decided to teach myself i printed out tabs off the internet and um you know the lyrics with the chords and i kind of just learned i i did have a classical training on the so i do know how to read and i first started writing on the piano actually and singing and writing and i still do that and actually now i'm generally playing keys more um although I, I i love playing guitar it's just easier on my back and it's just like it's just so fun. I just love it. I love having a keyboard and songwriting is definitely my favorite part about being an artist. It's hard. It's hard to choose though. You know, sometimes I'm like performing's my favorite because <laughs> I really love it all. Well, I, I have some friends here in Little Rock, uh, Cl Cliff and Susan and Susan plays piano, but she got herself a keytar. Do you think you'd ever grab a keytar <laughs> and play keyboard you know, because back in the 80s, that was all the rage. The The keyboardist, I, I believe it was born out of jealousy, is that the guitarist can get out there and, and you know, in front on, on front stage and kind of work the stage. And, and you know, the, the key, who, who invented the guitar? I'm sure somebody's looking it up right now as as we speak. But, uh, you know, do you ever think that you'd get a guitar and play one of those? I don't think I would buy one, but if I'm around, I might. <laughs> you know that's that's such a goofy instrument but it's really fun and i've seen people play it very very well so i like your friend like she probably you know would kick butt at it you know i think anything if you try to take it real seriously make it work 
Oh, she rocks that thing. And what what she mm-hmm. does is is instead of having a second keyboard, you know, if you're a keyboardist, I guess you you have one on the bottom to do something. And see, I, I don't know why you would have two keyboards, but she does. She takes that guitar and kind of lays it flat as her second keyboard. I don't know if maybe you play the rhythm on the bottom or you play different kinds of music on one type of keyboard or one's higher, one's one's pingy. What's the difference between all these keyboards that people play? I honestly don't know. I mean, I know like sometimes with keyboards that you can have um, different like sounds going at the same time you know you could have like an organ on the top or like like a hammond impression um you could have like one of them set up to be the bass like these are all really really low notes and then you could have the other one be synth like a high pitch synth i've seen people i think you can program it different ways you know because like on my keyboard i can change um i can change the settings in that way and i can split it so half the keyboard is like a bass guitar and the other half is a synth and so I think that's kind of the idea, like being able to be really creative and, and customize your instrument to your needs and like however you want to do it. Well, that's fancy. I could, I, I okay. I, growing up in the eighties, I'm a child of the eighties. I remember when MTV first started and they actually played music videos. And one of my favorite videos was flock of seagulls. I ran and I remember the keyboardist, you know, just had that, had that going. And a lot of music videos were, you know, featured the keyboard as part of their, you know, the synthesizers were all the rage. Even, okay, Van Halen back in 1978 famously said, we will never use synthesizers. And in 1983, they came out with their, their, uh, their, uh, 1984 album. Bam, bam, bam. I might as well jump. Oh my goodness. All synthesizer. So it's, you got to ch- roll with the times, change with the times. Wh- wh- uh, when you first started, it was it only uh, playing on the guitar or just so- solo? I mean, how did you break out? How did you get into this music business to where you can actually make a living doing it? Were you going to coffee shops or open mics, or how were you breaking out? Yeah, I mean, I got I definitely got started at open coffee shops is the first time that I played a gig. Um, it was a cop. Well, I, I take that back. The first time was actually an art gallery that had an open and it was called Seekers. And that's where I met a lot of the local people about. And at the time, I was still making art. So we would kind of get together and make art after the open mic. And everybody would kind of get up there and do their thing. And it was, it was cool because it was a very, like, community. It didn't feel like I don't know it it didn't feel like there was that much separation between the audience and the performer so it was really fun um and it felt like and then I started doing yeah little gigs at coffee shops um with with my ex who I had a little project with that was when I was like 17 18 and then I kind of got back out there uh like 2021 I was actually in music school and locally here at the, and I, I actually played with like a, a symphony orchestra on the harp. I, I specialized in the classical harp as my second instrument in college. Piano was the first. <laughs> so that was really fun. Um, I would love to do more of that. I kind of decided that um, finishing my music degree was not going to be worth it for me. Like it wasn't what I wanted to do. Um, classical music was not what I was trying to do and I was working and it was just like too much, you know, I need to like pay the rent. Um, but I would love to get a harp one day. It's on the books and the plans for, you know, when the house and the pool. You know. Aaron O'Dowd. Yeah. If we go to an Aaron O'Dowd show, I want them to roll in a harp and that, that'll yeah. be a surprise. That'll be magical. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I, I talk to some people here and, you know, do they have special skills? Yeah, they juggle or they, you know, they can do cards or whatever. Just break that stuff out or or they play trombone, but they, you know, but they also play, uh, you know, if you, if somebody rolled in a harp and all of a sudden Aaron O'Dowd's playing a song on a harp, you're going to blow minds. That's something yeah. different. You're giving the people more than they expected. That's fantastic. So, yeah, I, I've been to college a bunch of times. I understand sometimes it doesn't stick. Everything's on YouTube. You don't need to go to college. 
that's that's not a that's not a public service message i i want the scientists and the doctors and all the the people that are you know rocket scientists i want them to still go to college because that's important you know we mm-hmm. need we need those type of people the, yeah, the smart people the math people the science people but uh the creatives you can learn stuff on your own uh, mm-hmm. or maybe a couple of lessons here and there i you know i, I know what you mean about lessons i tried to uh play guitar i, I was uh working as a uh, ER tech in, um, in Miami. And one of the doctors played guitar and I had a guitar, but I never knew how to play it. And he tri- tried to teach me a few, uh, a few of the, the scales. And I was like, yeah, no, it didn't stick, you know, <laughs> they, taking guitar lessons, unless you really want it. Like you did, yeah. you, you'll take the tabs. Now, can you read music at all? Oh, yes. Yes. I don't use that so often though. I really don't use it for anything. It's it's like a random, like, oh, here's some Chopin, who's my favorite. And I'm in the mood to play a classical too. But so rare because I write so much. And I, my favorite thing to do is just sit down at the piano and just improv and just play. And and generally that's where my practice or whatever time starts. Just like some whatever comes out and then I'll just, okay, I'm going to play this song for a minute. Here, the other day it was the Titanic theme. I was, curious. I was laughing, but I sang that. Yeah, that was pretty. I could cover that. I don't know. If... I was singing the Mulan theme earlier. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I know. I know you, you have a cover out there. Uh, a Prince song is out there uh, that you yeah. covered. Love Prince. I actually named my dog after him. Um, it's my dog's favorite musical artist and one of mine, absolutely. I don't know. Maybe one of my top, he's just so creative, you know, like there's nobody like him. There's nobody that wrote as many different kinds of songs and just no boundaries, you know, creative. Really, really cool. Oh, from what I understand, people have gone through Paisley Park and there are tapes and tapes and tapes and tapes of music that was never released. Uh, You know, uh, Kevin Smith even said he made a a music video or a movie with Prince and Prince just shelved it and said, you know, thank you very Mm -hmm. much. Kevin Smith, you know, mall rats, clerks, uh, you know, Mm -hmm. chasing Amy, uh, Bill and, uh, you know, Jay and Silent Bob. And he made a he made a movie for Prince, and Prince said thanks, and then shelved it. Never see the light of day. What? You know. So I imagine there's so much he created, so much, and there is so much still out there that it has never seen the light of day. I know that there was a a song by Michael Jackson uh, that I I play. It's uh, "Love Never Felt So Good," and Justin Timberlake finished it after. Michael Jackson passed, but, uh, yeah, I guess I'm all, I'm all in digression now, but, uh, you're, you're making me think about music. Funny. You mentioned, uh, Amy Grant. People tell me that I look like Vince Gill. Oh, you do. I was wondering who you look like the whole time. I <laughs> love buddy. I don't know. Yes. Vince Gill is incredible. Well, who, such- who, who do people tell you that, that you look like? Um, the last person I got told I look like was the actress. Um, I believe her name is Cannon Tui. I might be saying it incorrectly. She's she plays Deer Woman in the FX show Reservation Dog, which is like my favorite show right now. And actually, now I get to throw a big shout out. The director and creator of that show, Sterling Harjo, is an old friend of mine from Tulsa. He's an incredible filmmaker. Um, he's actually from Wawoka, Oklahoma. I wrote a song about coincidentally so um it's it's really exciting to see that show taking off it's such an incredible show it's about um, four young teenagers growing up on the reservation in oklahoma and kind of like what everything they go through and it's like a very relatable show for anybody though but also like if you're from oklahoma like, you understand that so much of like the humor and references you know and um and it's it's also just a really great de- of native people that is more accurate and it's humorous and it's it's not um yeah it's it's a really great show. no i've <laughs> so been hearing about this sh- like the actress and i <laughs> yeah i've been yeah. hearing about this show and and i i heard that song we woke a, a little bit earlier and yeah i didn't know that it was about uh you know a spot in in oklahoma but um 
now we're turning this uh, show into hashtag Aaron O'Dowd on reser- <laughs> reservation uh, or reservation dogs. What was the name of it? Yeah, reservation dogs. Yeah, that's it. Hashtag Aaron O'Dowd on reservation dogs. Put her on that show. Put her <laughs> on that show. <laughs> Have you? Yeah, that would be amazing. That would be or a song on the show. The music on the show is really, really good, and it's it's pretty much mostly native artists, but there's some other songs on there, and it's it's really well done. I really love music and film, and just, like, I love the way that it helps tell the story, you know? And, like, like earlier, I actually just caught up on all the episodes that are out right now, and, and like, man, this song is so good, and it was like a cover of a... Um, a Flo Morrissey song, Look at What the Light Did Now. And I had to, I was like, for a minute, like, who, oh, that's Matthew White. Okay. I heard that song years ago, but it was such a good song that even though I'd only heard it like three times when I heard it in the show, I was like, I know this song and it's incredible. And just like the power of music and film working together, it's, it does wonders. It really does. Well, I was talking to my father in law just last weekend about, you know, you mentioned Chopin. He's talking about Tchaikovsky, and I'm talking about uh, Ludwig, van, uh, Ludwig van Beethoven, and we're both crying. We're bawling thinking about these songs. I was thinking about Ode to Joy, the ninth. There's a oh. reason that these songs have been around for hundreds of years. They're f- excellent songs, they're good songs to draw upon. Oh my goodness! You know, you listen to your Chopin. I'm sure you're going to get the feels, and it's there's no words. You know, some of the kids when I was growing up, I'm like, there's no words to this song. How, you know, what? How? Why did they call it Ode to Joy? It's there's no words. But then you start listening to it. Oh my goodness! What? I mean, what? What do you get from Chopin? What makes you love him so much? Yeah, the emotion. I think. That- compositions are incredibly emotive and um you know he's french i just feel like the french style is really awesome i mean even more modern french composer the jan tiersen that did the amelie soundtrack um and i guess now that movie is kind of dated but when i was in high school that was like the fun artsy kid movie and it's still one of my favorite movies the songs just like chopin they really just like take you on a journey and it's so engaging. Like if you just close your eyes, you're just like, you don't need a, a smartphone or you don't need visuals, you know, like the music enough is just transporting. Like it's, I think that's really what, what does it for me. And the songs are also just so interesting. You know, he, he, I don't know if he went out of his way to be interesting or he's just, that's his expression of himself. But, you know, I know as me as a writer, I, want things to be boring and sometimes I do I'm like okay that's too typical how can I make that more but other times like so I think with with his songs there's kind of a macrocosm and a microcosm for that there's just a lot of different textures and sounds and it's just really wonderful I mean but you know you you want to keep it interesting and not boring but then again you do want it boring you know you have to <laughs> you have to get on that tightrope between commercial and what you really want you know the and somehow you know you want to sell some albums but then you want to be true to your artistry and it's kind of oh it's that that balance how do you keep how do you keep so high on that balance how, how do you do you do everything just because you love it or do you keep in the back of your head you know if i do this four and four and talk about this this uh subject matter yeah i'll probably get a hit out of it well oh man, that's kind of a hard one but i have to quote uh someone who i i watched their master class last night it was like a spotify for artist master class just caught my eye and i finally watched it and he's an artist manager his name is amit narukar and he manages several artists um, that I had not heard of, but they're they're pretty big. They're just like not in my genre. So, um, but his some of the artists he's worked with like Run the Jewels. You know, everybody loves Run the Jewels. Um, and he gave all this advice on kind of like keeping it real, on being authentic within your art. And it was really awesome because I feel like he put succinct words to things that I had thought about but couldn't like explain. So, so the the thing he said 
made me um, that really made me think and and that kind of answers your question is like he doesn't believe there's any such self doubt and I know that that's like kind of a controversial thing to say but the way he explained it that made so much sense is that like there it's just it's like what do you want from your music do you want a cereal box okay well you're gonna do what to be on the cereal box and you're gonna get the paycheck but he's like if you don't want to be cereal box awesome well you're not going to get the paycheck but whatever you're doing it should be what makes you happy and fulfilled and i was like you know that that makes a lot of sense he was talking about how some artists they they don't care they'll just like okay this is a big opportunity they'll take it and other artists like they don't want to align themselves with a certain brand you know they don't want a budweiser commercial because they don't want to be conveyed in a certain way and i think with songwriting like there's a lot of truth to that because people talk about artists selling out and I think it's very subjective. I think that's like, oh, my my judgment of this person is. Bad. But I don't view it that way at all. Like, I think especially after having been in Nashville and having submerged myself in the music industry and just focusing on learning everything I can and like anything that I want to do. Well, I have to learn how to do that first, you know, like, you know, people can talk all the crap they want about like you know, the most famous of artists, but like the closer you get into that scene, you realize they work really, really hard, you know, regardless of what you think of their music. And they make a lot of sacrifices. Too. Like, I think the idea of selling out is kind of funny because those people work harder than anybody else. They're constantly on the road. They're constantly doing interviews like this. They, they don't have a lot of time to themselves. Like, I think if anything, they're almost doing a public service, you know, it's like, they really believe in that. So, you know, I also think, you know, if you think someone's life is like kind of simple and you're like, oh, you, you try to call it dumb. It's like, well, maybe you're just kind of insulting that way of life because there are people that to them, they really like trucks and hot girls. And, you know, that's not my favorite country song. And as an artist, I'm like, yeah, there's definitely a formula of songs with like, there's a thing with male country artists where it's like, why is this all the same song? You've probably seen that famous mashup video with with all the bro country songs. And it's like, ah, you know, and, and there is something to that. But like there are also a lot of really great artists that are mainstream and um, especially like with mainstream country. Some of my favorite new country artists are kind of making it in the mainstream country, but they're female. And I've noticed that the females are being way more original. And I'm like, OK, well, how much is how much of this? Is not it's not that um, there are artists out there. It's what's what has money behind it, because obviously that industry is giving money to the women that are unique, and they're giving money to the men that are completely mediocre. And it's kind of a phenomenon, and I don't totally get it. And people will tell you that's what sells, and I think, well, you're trying to sell that. Stuff. And you know, this is like a much bigger conversation, but going into like clear channel taking over the radio well what happens you know the djs discovered the music the artists got discovered by building relationships with djs like loretta lynn drove all over the country with her demos that's you know that's that was a different day and age you know these days i reach out to people on twitter or you know how we found each other it's but it's kind of the same thing and yeah it's it's also i think the the benefit of being an artist now is that there's just a lot more opportunity. You know, there's a lot of different ways to do what you want to do. Like you don't have to kind of just like, okay, this is, this is the five step plan, you know, so many different ways that you can market yourself or um, you can do Patreon. You could even never play a live show <laughs> and everybody could be listening to your track on Spotify. And I feel like there's not really a wrong way to do it, you know? And that's really empowering me lately. Like the more I go on my journey and life, as an artist, I develop as a person, as an artist, like, I just feel a lot more free to just do whatever the heck I want. And it's really empowering. It's really nice. I love your passion, Air No Doubt. That's what I want you to go with for all your career, all the rest of your <laughs> life. My goodness. Hey, don't be uh, uh, beholden to anyone. But you you're, you were talking about the, uh, the formulaic uh, boy songs. And then I'm thinking about the answer that Maddie and Tay had with a girl in a country song. I thought that music video was fantastic. Oh. You ever heard it? 
I actually haven't heard of that. Okay, Maddie and Tay had a, a a song called, you know, I'm a girl in the country song, but the video is all, you know, men, you know, robust men, maybe men that aren't in the best of shape, uh, mm-hmm. wearing their overalls and getting sprayed down while they're washing cars and, you know, st- stuff that typically would be uh, misogynistic, but uh, the reverse of that, you know, uh, getting getting played on the men. And it, it's, a, it's a girl in a country song by Maddie and Tay. I thought that was a, a pretty good answer to the bro songs about uh, girls and trucks and, and a beer and a Ford and a fish and, a, you know, it, it very formulaic songs. But then, you know, you listen to some of the, the boy bands while you were growing up in the 90s, it, you know, uh, Break My Heart, Tear Us Apart, uh, yeah. you know, n- n- Never See me, me Go, I Want to Love You So. It's all, you know, it was all formulas. And, you know, I don't want you to be stuck with that formula, but I want you to have commercial success too. And once mm-hmm. again, we're on that tightrope, uh, you know, w- wandering through. But, you know, I see um, Taylor Swift, you know, the one of the greats. Uh, she's uh, doing her own thing. She re-recorded all mm-hmm. her masters so she could own them. And you were talking about, um, you know, girls that that are, are making it and, and being original and being different. Gretchen Wilson, I love her. You know, yeah. and, and Marin Mar- uh, Maris, you know, I love her, you know, fantastic. The ladies are really bringing it. And, and I play every Friday night over at the Rab in Conway, Arkansas, shameless plug, and, you know, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm there and I get to choose the theme. So maybe my theme this weekend will be girls in country, you know, and of course, uh, of course, a little air, no doubt is going to show up with your, your music video, uh, from <laughs> I 44, uh, the, the antique mall. But, uh, you know, I appreciate that so much, man. But, you know, I, I, I know that I've been taking, taking some of your time. You're, 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 uh, you're, you're starting to fade away as, th- as time progresses. And I want you to, uh, I, I, I want to, um, to end this thing and finish this thing off. But um, I don't want this to be the last time that we talk as uh, time progresses, as you have more things come out as uh, you know, if you want to promote uh, more albums, like you have albums out there. We haven't even talked about those. I'm looking yeah. at, yeah, I'm looking at your, uh, your band camp and you have at least four albums. I mean, I don't even think people did albums anymore. I thought it was all singles. <laughs> those are actually some of the are- I have one album out called Old Town, and you can find it anywhere that um, things are streamed or watched. You can also buy it, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, on the Apple Store. Bandcamp is, as you've been mentioning, is the best place to buy it um, because that way the artist actually gets the money. Uh, with Apple, like I get a pretty good chunk of it. Apple is better about paying artists than some of the other stream, streaming platforms, but. Um, Yes, I have several singles out. Um, the Christmas song you mentioned. Then there's um, Robin's Egg Blue, Silver Lake. And I'm working on a ton of new music right now. So that's kind of the focus um, is writing. And then I'm going to hopefully record in the next year. I don't know exactly. You know, I don't have like the plan, but it's one of those things where it's like, well, I know I'm going to do it and I'm just going to like figure it out as I go along. And I have some producers in mind pretty big industry connections that like I want to develop those connections and see where those can lead. Cause you know, it really is a long game. I could, I could crappily record that, put it out or I could give it like a year and like get commercial success. You know what I mean? And so it's like, I would rather do that. Um, I would rather take my time and make the best music I can. Well, I know you already mentioned Dale Wood Sound in East Nashville with King Corduroy. Uh, yeah. do, you, do you have any other people uh, that you'd like to give shout outs to that have helped you along the way? Um, well, I worked with an engineer named Brian Bell, and we actually did a song at Zach Brown's old studio, which unfortunately closed in Nashville. Um, it was an old church, and it was absolutely the nicest studio I've ever been in and recorded at. And he was the head engineer there. So that song is not out like um i think they were initially going to make like a compilation album of all the artists that that did this podcast and these interviews but um there is a video of it somewhere on my instagram and um he and i had talked about doing my next um but we haven't talked since like 2020 
pandemic hit and I had some health stuff. So things have, have kind of been a little bit slowed down, delayed for me on that. But I think the fun part or like the silver lining of that is that I've had more time to write on songs and I feel like the songs that I'm coming out with now are better and um I've had more time to really like sit with them because for me like I'm more of a Leonard Cohen songwriter than like a Taylor Swift like um I don't I don't, like, try to crank out a song in one hour and sometimes I do sometimes the song is like boom hey I'm here and other times the song is like why don't we just get to know other over six years and you know and then maybe you just need a little motivation from like say a tv show wanting a song and okay i'll finish the song so yeah i really think it's a, like a highly individual process but i do have a title for the next album and i have more than enough songs i'm just kind of waiting for like spirit to like guide me into like which songs and why you know because because those moments happen where you just like you know this is the song and um, it just feels right. And especially when you have a concept album, there's something that you're conveying. Like the album is definitely not dead. I think, you know, Daniel F. The pay artists more and stop saying ridiculous things because he doesn't choose what art is. He just owns a business, you know? He is not an artist. He's not a musician. And I'm not like condemning Spotify, but like they need to like do better. <laughs> and um, artists should absolutely make albums if they want make albums if you want to do singles like awesome that's great and and on that note i'll probably release like a single or two leading up to the album and then drop the whole thing that's kind of my plan and then have like, extras you know b side like new vinyl i'm a huge vinyl nut a lot of my fans are i know they would love that and um yeah i am getting darker the sun's going down i'm in front of the window so i'm just getting closer <laughs> Well, I, I, I miss uh, having albums in hand. You know, as a DJ growing up, I had my two turntables and a microphone, and I, yeah. I miss the, the tactile, the, the you know, holding an album in my hand, reading liner notes, uh, things like that. But you, you mentioned Leonard Cohen, and fantastic that you did. You know, best known for writing Hallelujah, and that Jeff Buckley uh, performed and, and really made it big. But Hallelujah, at one point, had over 50 verses to it. That was a song that would not get finished. It had to be abandoned pretty much because he, yeah. he just kept writing and writing that song, just inspired and inspired. It was years and years and years and rewriting. And this is, and that's why he has this perfect, you know, the, these little hints of genius. Uh, you know, if you listen, I mean, really listen to Leonard Cohen, not just ha hallelujah, but his, his whole catalog, I mean, uh, everybody knows, oh, my goodness, what an amazing song, you know, that really uh, challenges, you know, the, the society and what's happening in the world. You know, we need to take care of each other. I've mentioned that in the beginning, and I'm mentioning it again. But, um, mm -hmm. oh, my goodness, yeah, be a Leonard Cohen. If you're going to be, yeah, if, if you're going to be anywhere on the spectrum, be that. It might take you a little bit longer to get there, but you'll get there, and get there you will. Yeah, the only person, funny, the only person in the industry, I have to tell this funny story, that has ever told me to write different, you know, I had a meeting with him and he owned a publishing company. I, I don't even remember his name. He's completely out of the business now because he actually scammed his artists and he actually sexually assaulted a couple of them. Really turned out to be terrible. But, you know, in this meeting, I'm like, this is the cool guy and I want to get a publishing deal and I'm just meeting with him and fortunately nothing you know terrible happened but he i told him about my writing process and he's you can't do that you can't wait to finish songs you need to finish them right away or they'll lose the magic and and i was just looking at him like that's not me like you're not looking for me if that's if that's what you want in a writer and and that's too when i realized also i'm not a staff writer I'm not a, like a nine to five clock in and, and write the song robotically because to me if a song doesn't have meaning like it doesn't mean it. it doesn't have anything like there's nothing to it and you know there are songs out there you hear and you can hear the difference between a song that has soul and a song that doesn't really have soul you know you can hear that forced and you can hear, you can hear that <laughs> and um yeah so like I'm, I'm all about that and I, I don't really you know I think that's I don't know 
I'll let you ask me more questions. <laughs> for like no, I, hey, I love it when you go <laughs> off on a tangent and start thinking about things. This is when the podcast really gets interesting. Is is you yeah. have you have these thoughts that maybe that have been bottled up inside. And speaking of bottle, sometimes songs are lightning in a bottle. Bam, yeah. they get written in two or three hours and recorded in the same day oh. and then become mega hits that can and has happened. It's few and far between. You know, sometimes it takes, you know, the process takes time. And I feel for the artist that, that writes their first album and they've had their whole life you know, until they were 21, 22 years old to get that first album. And then here's a record company says, all right, do it again in a year or two, do it again, exactly the same, but better, you know, and you've had your, you've had 22 years to do that first album. And now you got two years to do that second album, you know? Yeah. Oh, it's so, so much pressure, but don't, yeah, don't let it get to you. You're going to stay, you're staying independent or have you been approached by a record company to uh, to help you get your career to the next level, um, I wouldn't say like approach. I had certain opportunities that I chose not to pursue in the past. Um, some of these labels that have a good amount of clout are actually kind of like pay to play. Well, that's maybe not the right term, but you're actually paying them, and I'm like, that's not really sustainable for me. And you know, I guess if you have a lot of money saved up. And, and you want to do that, that's fine. I've seen it work for people. I've seen people go on to get Grammy nominations working with this company. They're great. Um, I, I chose to work with a small record label um, that's in Tulsa for the first album. Um, and I'm glad I did because I didn't really know what I was doing as far as like trying to release my own record. But after being in Nashville, if you learning, just observing, asking questions, I'm confident i can release an entire album by myself if i choose to do that and do all of the promo um i did have like a press deal for the first album um so i had but a lot of the stuff i've done has has come to me you know as a result of putting myself out there doing doing my thing you know and so i don't know you know like we'll see what happens i, I definitely have some major label like contacts connections but i think it's really going what it's going to come down to is like, who is going to be the best supporter of your music? And and this is the best advice I maybe have ever got. I don't know who gave it to me. I've heard people say this, but like, if you, it's the same thing as being an artist manager. Like if you're going to have someone kind of have that much say over your, your music release and your decisions, they need to be as passionate about your music as you are, period. They need to be a complete cheerleader for you. Otherwise, you're just going to fall by the wayside for a lot of artists signing major record deals, that's what happens to them. They become, oh, that's the little guy, you know, and you don't want that. That's going to be worse. That can, um, that can really put a death sentence to your career. I mean, cause, cause you sign what you sign a deal to put out two, three albums and they don't really push you, you know? Um, so yeah, like I'm, I'm definitely just going to feel my way forward as far as like what I decide to do and, um, you know, see what happens. I'd be perfectly happy putting the record out myself if that's going to be the best way of doing it. Cause like, I know what I want, you know, like a Taylor Swift minded person in that way. Like she, I know she, um, comes up with her music video ideas and she directs them. Like she's like in the driver's seat and that's a hundred percent how I am. And I'm like, I'm not going to let anybody take over that will change my vision. Like, absolutely not. Like I have a vision. I'm an artist. That's why I do this. So Yes, I would love commercial success. Never sacrifice my art for that. And I think what's great is like I don't think you have to I think less than ever. You don't have to. And like there are ways to do. It. And some of the some of the best artists out there are just completely independent and have always been. And and they're they have like the most loyal following in the world. Because their following knows like, hey, we're the ones that pay their bills, you know. <laughs> and they love that. I think that's the thing about music fan. And I'm fan is like i love supporting the artists i love knowing that like me buying their t-shirt helps feed their kids like there's just something really cool and then i get to listen to the music and enjoy it and like i really value the art you know i think as as a society we need to value art more um i know many of us do but it's it's sad that you know art is devalued and we expect it for free and we you know everything's free and like it's there's so much work that goes 
listen to an album release. Like most people have no idea or even playing a live show, like all the hours you spent practicing your instrument, writing your song, buying your gear. Like it's one of the most expensive, <laughs> you know, um, careers and, and you're just starting out. Just wait till you do your taxes. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> you'll write everything off. Um, so yeah, it'll, it'll be a fun adventure here. I, I'm just really excited. I can't wait to put more music out and like see how it touches people too. I think that's like the best thing when people give you that feedback and it touches them. It's like the best feeling in the world. Well, you're giving the people gems, Aaron O'Dowd. And yes, the music business, so tough. Uh, you, you can, it can be rewarding. Yes, the money's good. But the money can be good, but the work is not steady. And mm -hmm. health insurance, you got none <laughs> for the most part, you know, unless you buy your own, which is so expensive here in this country, in the U.S. of A., you know, and I hope that that changes at some point. I don't want free health care. I want, I want affordable health care. I don't want free school. I want affordable school. You know, some, something's got to give here. So, you know, uh, uh, we, we have the ability to take care of each other. There's so much uh, capital in this country. But you're talking about, um, you know, with social media, uh, you know, some of these record companies won't touch you unless you already have a following of tens of thousands of people. And then they approach you because you're already making money and they want to take some of that money. Yeah, that's that's not at all the way that people should go. You know, that's, I've seen some feedback on that lately from people talking about like how their record label told them, we're not going to release your single until you have a viral TikTok." And I'm just like, what? Like a TikTok? Is this why we're making music? And like, I kind of hate TikTok. I have a TikTok. I, I started it. It can be fun, but I think it's just like, I don't know. There's just so much that goes into like making each video and like time wise, like there's only so much time we have as an artist. And I, I want to spend my time making my art the best it can be. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I know a lot of artists have social media managers. I don't at this point, I do that all myself. And I know that that's something that could, that could help me to like supplement that activity because it really takes a lot out of you. And in, um, one thing I noticed too, is making a TikTok. um, making an, a reel or, or whatever on Instagram, um, which I, I prefer Instagram, but um, it takes creative energy too. And when you expend that, you're kind of taxed, you know, you're kind of not thinking about the songwriting that day. You're like, oh, I'm kind of worn out. Uh, that's how it is for me. So I, I think that approach is really hard to like art, you know, bring slow art back, bring like not just trying to churn out content because you know, like I see some artists that are, are famous just because they have good content and that's fine. You know, be entertained. I'm not ragging on it, but like, it should be about the art. Like you're a musician, make the music, you know what I mean? So that's, that's definitely like, no, not, not my approach. Although like social media is fun and I enjoy building my social presence. Cause like you're building a following and it's really wonderful to have that. Like you need an audience as an artist. And if you're not out performing constantly, um, like social media is a really great way to kind of like um, supplement that. So for me, like going through health challenges, like it's been really nice to have social media to keep my art alive. And yeah, social media, you know, uh, double edged sword for sure. Like it brings a lot of perks for artists to communicate with their fans and yeah. <laughs> It can be used for good. And Aaron O'Dowd and my listener, before you start sending emails, I know that we're talking about uh, the making of content as we're making content. Yes. <laughs> All, right. All right. Let's 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 take this thing home. Uh, Aaron O'Dowd, um, I found I found your link tree. AaronO'Dowd.com is not working right now, but I did find your link tree and I found huh. the, um, your various social medias, uh, Aaron O'Dowd, Aaron dot O'Dowd point 92. Um, and then EO Diddy. I like that. I, I like that. I found that I, your Twitter is EO yeah. Diddy and your YouTube is EO Diddy. So, uh, why Diddy? Um, a Diddy is just like a funny word for a song. So it's a Diddy. Like, I think I don't know where that came from, but I think of it like a jingle. Um, so I'm always writing songs and I'm always singing like silly little songs, like dog and 
um, you know, I, I don't know. It just came in my head one day and I decided to use that. <laughs> EO are my initials. All right. Like, EO, Aaron, Dong, you know. Aaron O'Dowd, bit- I'll be following you around on your various social medias. We'll be keeping in touch from time to time. Come on back anytime you want, anytime you want to promote something new. I've had a, 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 a sincere pleasure talking to you yeah, and finding out too. more about you. you. Now, I usually, uh, do you have anything else you need to divulge to the people? Well, I will promote my upcoming show, and it's my first show back since my whole um, health thing. So it'll be during Americana Fest week in Nashville. I'm playing uh, Sunday, September 18th at the Yazoo Brewing Company. And it's actually in Madison, Tennessee, but very close to East Nashville. So I'm playing with quite a few other artists. Um, doing an in the round set from 4 to 5 p.m. September 18th, Nashville, Tennessee. Yazoo Brewing Company. And there's, yeah, it's all over. It's going to be all over my social. So if you're in Nashville or be around for Americana Fest, um, please stop. It's a free show. You can bring your dogs, your kids. Um, there's food. There's drinks, alcoholic and non-alcoholic. So there's something for everyone, which is always great. <laughs> Fantastic. Aaron O'Dowd, I usually finish these things off with last words for the people. This could be words to live by, something you heard a long time ago, or just whatever you, uh, you know, maybe a mantra that you wake up with every morning or whatever pops into your head at this moment in time. Aaron O'Dowd, give the last words for the people. <laughs> Put me on the spot. I think like gratitude, you know, especially if you're having a bad day or you're feeling negative, just think about like two or three things you're grateful for. Because even if you're kind of like, Meh, I don't want to do this or you, if you don't feel anything right in that moment, it, it helps reorient your perspective. And um, gratitude is a lot of hard times. And I think it, it's definitely important in these times whatever times you're in in your own personal life like yeah just remember choose gratitude always there you have it party people aaron o'dowd that's just a little bit a little taste of the story of aaron o'dowd the ballad of aaron o'dowd she's old man you know i say she was old timey country she's got that that old style feel but there's still a new quality so it's like a blend a, a, a perfect aaron o'dowd blend of the old and the new, not your typical country song that you might hear, you know, and there's nothing typical about Erin O'Dowd. She's fantastic, you know, and now, and she's going to be, it's just the beginning. She directed and starred in her own trick pony video that she, you know, she scouted location for it. Uh, you know, uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I see big things happening not just a singer songwriter but also a director of music videos possibly short videos and possibly features uh, you know she's got that creative uh, that creative background that she got back in school and switched it over to music i think it's all going to blend it's all going to come together the foundations are already laid out the bricks are already laid out uh, for a great foundation i can see this building this Aaron O'Dowd structure getting higher and higher and just, oh, uh, th- there's nothing you can't do. Uh, you put your mind to it, Aaron O'Dowd. You you got this, and I appreciate knowing you, and I appreciate you being on the What Makes You Famous podcast and telling a little bit about, about yourself, a little of your story. Now, uh, now, oh, now that's it for this edition of What Makes You Famous. If you, yes, you, my loyal listener, if you'd like to tell your story, I encourage you to give me a call, 501-470-6386, or email keysdan at aol.com. That's it for me. It's keysdanradiowhat.com, djlittlerock.com. Peace. I'm out of here.